I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. I'm not. I'm not surprised. I don't know how. What's up, pops? How you doing today? Greetings, brother. What's going on? I can't hear you. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How are we gonna How are we gonna know if you were like laughing, like or? You're not supposed to know. This is. I just wanted to show everybody that I'm following guidelines and adhering to my culture at the same time. You're wearing that in the house? No, I just came back from walking. Oh, you were walking? Yeah, I was walking. Speaking about walking. <laughs> 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 I hope you got. I hope. <laughs> I hope you got some energy for today, man. <laughs> No, no, I don't like walking. I, I didn't get a chance to work out yet, so I just want to... Did I turn the oven on? Making sure. What's up, though, man? Happy birthday, bro. Happy belated. What's going on? What are you talking about? Oh, the birthday thing, yeah? The birthday. That's what I meant. Snuffing, Snuff, yeah. man. You, you, you want to know you how do I... for your birthday? You being funny. No, I'm just saying, like, I always tell... Uh, people that you know during this time they're always gonna be like oh this is gonna be the worst birthday it's not gonna be fun like what are we gonna do we're, we're cooped up inside I was like instead of making it a memorable birthday in the negative why not make it find a way to make it memorable and one of your best birthdays you know uh, in a good way yeah you know uh, you know what's what's weird beside um Side that I feel different, you know. I I, I feel different. I, I woke up today and I felt different, you know. I just I Would felt it. Different in what way, though, bro? I felt it, man. I was like, you know what? This this is where we stop counting. So this this. this <laughs> nah, you're not that. You're not that. Nah, 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 nah. Listen, listen. This is where we stop counting. This we move different from here. So I woke up, man, and and obviously I was thankful for, you know, another year and. We're not gonna say how old, but just just you know another year. But Matt, Matt is grown, man. You know it's it's. Uh, but in a way, I kind of like the quarantine uh, birthday. Why is that? Because it's it's there was no expectation. Like I didn't have to plan. Uh, I didn't have to like set up anything. Whether it's you know we gotta go to this restaurant, we gotta go here. We got it wasn't. It was just yo just people sending me messages which. By the way, I'm I'm so thankful and happy, man. I, I got messages for some from so many people that it just made my day. You know, it made my day, and it's uh, you know, you just realize you know a lot of really really good people. Like people care. Uh, that part was was dope, and I think most of the time when I'm busy with going to party or going to dinner, which is great, you kind of don't get to send everyone a thank you, you know, for reaching out. And that, that was dope. So, right. you know, it was good to experience a birthday where I'm just sitting there answering back and just watching what everyone is saying and messaging. It was dope. But uh, I know today it's not about my birthday. It's, uh, hold on, before we start. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you're, you're lucky. You're lucky I couldn't, I had my, my, my chain. Is in storage, bro. I was I was looking for it, man. I was you know, you know when I put on the hat, yeah. My brother said, "Yo, you know, pups is coming with the chain." <laughs> yeah, I, said, I was all oh, man. I was looking. I said, for, I "Couldn't get yo, it." Yo, I, I said, "Listen, I said the chain is so long, he's gonna have to wear it, but the goat has to sit on the." <laughs> yeah, nobody gonna see it, right? So I was gonna have to hold it. So hey, but I bought. In, in honor of my boy, I wore yeah, the, the, that's dope. the chain he gave, he gave me though. This one of my favorite necklaces, bro. For you sure. know, I, I I was practicing today, and mm -hmm. I prepared myself. Every time I say a joke, I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we had a joke. Baby. Yo, nah, let me stop. <laughs> oh, man. Nah, but uh, nah, today I'm excited. I'm excited about today, man. Mm -hmm. Seriously, it's, it's, I'm, I'm really excited about this episode because obviously we're talking about uh, the future of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but we, you and I spoke about it before, and we spoke with Benson a little bit of what we want to share first before we get in, into it. Right. But we wanted to share the stories of just growing up being African, um, you know, because now we, we're looking at the future of Africa and how people are going back consistently. Um, 
you know, when it was time back then, it was, you know, you didn't want to mention you're African. You, you mm -hmm. tried to avoid it. You were African at home. You weren't African outside the house uh, because of the image and how we were portrayed. And all the stories that your parents try to tell you, it was just from your parents. You couldn't convince other people because they couldn't see it. And it's mm -hmm. different. So I, I want us to kind of talk about that a little bit. Because um, for me, obviously, it's different. You grew up in... Uh, North London, but your parents, you know, kept the culture. It, it, oh, you know, yeah. your, your siblings, everyone, which is, you know, it's so dope. For me, I didn't speak English till I was 11. You know, that's when I came over to the UK. So wow. it's, it's different for me than it is for you. And, and why I say that is because for you to, since you're born to be able to speak English, understand that culture, fit right in, but you had the African culture at home, you were able to kind of, you know, be in and out. Uh, I, I really wasn't. I, I came in and I couldn't hide it. You just, you, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't speak back to you. You knew, and all I knew was to tell you where I'm from. You know, so let's we take us back to yeah. Someone actually said it. Take the us what? back to the Dwayne days. You know, oh, let us know man. about the Dwayne days. Rough. Um, that's crazy because for me, you know, we growing up. The African kid, and you could when you know my my friend uh, Bo said it best. You know, you grow up trying to be different your whole life. You grow up, I mean, trying to be fit into the crowd and try to be one of your peers and one of your friends. And for the longest, I always just try to fit in. I always just try to fit in and just be, um, you know, be a part of you know the crew. And it wasn't happening. I was taller than everybody else. I was darker than everybody else. And, you know, my name, like, only two of my siblings have what they deem English names, you know? So, you know, my youngest brother, Benson, he's called Benson. My oldest, my sister's called, uh, what's it called? Uh, Audrey. And so, you know, they have English names. And for me, my, my first name is Nana. <laughs> and, you know, you know, kids in, in, in growing up, man, kids are mean. Kids are mean, bro. And there it goes, my boy right there. You said it. I, t I swear to you, when I was young, I would never tell them, you know, my name was Pops or Nana. I was like, my middle name is, is Dwayne. But I, I go by Dwayne. <laughs> yeah, okay. I could never get over Dwayne. I swear. And I, try, and I tried it, bro. I tried it. I really tried hard to be like, yeah, I'm African, but my, my, my middle name is Dwayne, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the men that... And... It wasn't until, you know, they used to make fun of me, call me the black banana, the uh, African booty scratch, all that, or all, all African batty cream, all, all, that, all that stuff. And those are, and these were my friends, bro. These are the people that were close to me. Now, imagine the people who didn't like me. You know what I'm saying? So it was tough. It was tough growing up like that. And I just tried to hide from my culture so much. I tried to hide from who I was. I didn't want my friends and the people around me to see um, the African culture that, that was, you know, who, who, my, who I was. Yeah. And it really wasn't until, gosh, a few years ago. And I know you're a big part of that. I say you're a big part of that. Too. It wasn't until I would say at least seven, eight years ago, maybe a little further back, um, that I really started to embrace my culture and embrace who I was. Because if you think about it, when I was younger, when I tried so hard to fit in, I didn't realize I was standing out. You know, I was a dark-skinned kid whose clothes didn't fit him. I had a curl, um, and my parents were just doing what they thought was best. Fast forward to my life right now, my culture and what makes me different is also what makes me special. And, I, you know, I definitely want, you know, if there's any young kids or anybody else out there who is struggling or dealing with you know, their culture are dealing with, you know, the difficulties of being young in this day and age and being different, you have to, you have to embrace it. You have to embrace who you are and understand that you're, you're beautiful and you're great in your own regard um, when it comes to that kind of stuff. And I didn't understand that until I was, I was old enough. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy you said that because when I came, when I came to England, it was, uh, it was totally different. I, you know, I came in, obviously didn't speak the language. Um, I was, I was more, I was more trying to fit in. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I didn't really have time to try to fake it. Um, you know, I just I felt like, 
Uh, it's hard to fake English. it when you don't speak English. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Not only that, but I, I first, you know, we first lived in Wimbledon, so I went to school that. Oh, I knew you, you know, had some some chief in you too, boy. Wimbledon, what's out there? Exactly. That's why we moved, didn't it? <laughs> but yo, so uh, so we're in Wimbledon, and I go to school, and there's about you know three black kids in the whole school, uh, mm -hmm. the school that I went to, and I was and, my you, and you made up two of them. Yeah. Yeah, and then <laughs> I was basically, I was basically trying to like, you know, get these kids to understand where I come from, uh, what's my background, and mm -hmm. you know, and I had a hard time trying to communicate with them. So I felt like, you know, playing football and playing basketball was the only way to to, to fit in. Mm -hmm. So I started to to try to dominate sports for for me to fit in, for them to to get to know and respect me in a different way because I couldn't really hold a conversation. I couldn't wow. jump in. I, I, I didn't know, like, you know, how to do it. I, you know, it's totally different world, totally different mm -hmm. world. I'm coming from Egypt, being there five years, refugees, are, and now I'm in Wimbledon and I'm right into school. So I just started playing sports, kids, you know. So then when I moved to uh, South Norwood and went to St. Mary's, it was nothing but African kids, you know, Jamaican kids and African kids in the whole school, exactly. you know, and, and it was, this is the days of Michael Deng, you know, this is the days of, <laughs> this is the days of Roadman, you know, I, a road I, man, I, no, man. <laughs> seriously, so I wasn't alone, I felt like, you know, and I saw Andrew, my boy Andrew, who actually, uh, from Jamaica, who was in school with me at St. Mary's, one of my really close friends, mm. we used to just, you know, it was a crew, it was just, it didn't matter, you know, it was like left and right. You just fell right in and it was a pride mm -hmm. thing, you know? And then when I came over to the US and I go to Blair Academy, this is when my pride even got bigger. I, I started to see like, yo, I come from Africa. I come from South Norwood. I come from Croydon. You know what I mean? I go to Brixton. I, I started walking around with that chip on my shoulder and try to let everyone know. Everyone would tell you when I went to Blair, it was, I'm African. It wasn't even I'm from South Sudan. It was just I'm African. And then I realized the name Michael Deng had to go, you know, and uh, it just like, yo, the wall got it. It's just that, you know, it, it built up, it built up, it built up. And then going to the league, like you said, you know, I took that my first trip going back to South Sudan in 2010 before independence. Um, and it was the first time, the first time in my life that from, you know, from the morning till night, you know, I walked around without everyone looking at me or questioning where I'm from. You know, mm -hmm. it was the first time that I felt like, yo, I fitted right in. I didn't look left or right. Everyone looks like you. Everyone is on the same boat. Everyone is trying to, you know, make it happen. Everyone has pride. It wasn't, you know, you walk in a restaurant and everything stops, whether it's your height or your skin color or your accent or whatever. It's the first time I ever felt it in my life, you know, and I, and I was just, and I came back to the league determined to be an all-star only to lift that shirt that was the whole reason That's after that man i was insane, so moved. Bro. you know because that was That's the year insane. yeah because that was the year uh me and amadou we went to ghana we went to tanzania um we went to angola this was my first time going around the continent and i came back and i'm like yo this you know people are not getting the information of what africa is you know, you're, you're being misled of what it is and it's affecting people's pride and, you know, people trying to stand up. And we're so divided. And we talked, me and you talked about this. You know, we're in Africa, they divided us so much with lines that we get caught up in, you know, those areas that they created because our language are not the same where your neighbor, you know, like South Sudan, we're attached to Congo, but Congo, they're speaking French, we speak in English just because of who colonized yours, Arabic. You know what I mean? And it's, and it's the same people. Uh, and you're outside there, you know, not representing the whole continent. And the whole thing has changed now. And, you know, and that's why we're going to talk about the future of Africa, because now people are connected. You know, you could get on your phone right now, like the kid who tagged me and you from Ghana was playing outdoor. You know, we couldn't have done that a few years ago. You know what I mean? So with all that being said, that's what I want to go to. I, I want to go to... No, but we have to speak about. We have to talk. We have to touch on something, bro. So you're telling me, go to South Sudan, and from that moment forward, you're like, I'm gonna be an all star. Solely raise that T-shirt. I swear to God, I, I, and I kept telling, I kept telling people, I had, I bought those T-shirts beginning of the year, 
and they had no logo on it, no nothing. They just had the Africa map. They didn't have who's making the T-shirt or nothing, you know. And we bought three of them. I bought three of them and I kept them in the house, right? And I just kept reminding myself, I got to raise that shirt. I got to be an all-star. I got to do it. I got to do it. it. Just, I just felt I had to do it. I had to make it happen to just show everyone not where I'm from, but people weren't talking about Africa. It wasn't in a conversation at all. Nobody was doing anything, you know? And I felt like, okay, this is going to go, uh, it's going to be good or it's going to be bad, right? And it was the whole thing. ESPN, every day, they were talking about, yo, should the wall get fine? What, you know? And what saved me was I found out that, not to go too much into detail, but the T-shirt was being sold. The same make a T-shirt was being sold, and that's what saved me from getting fined. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, and till today, I don't know if he kept it, but after the uh, All-Star game, Carmelo came up to me. Uh, Carmelo came up to me and asked me for that T-shirt, and I remember giving it to Carmelo. Uh, Carmelo has the, the one you had on it. Uh, the, the, the one, the one that I held up. I gave it to Carmelo, and the crazy thing is. Out of all the players right now, if you look the active players, maybe a few, but Carmelo is very active in Africa, and he's done a lot of basketball courts in Africa. He has a clothing line that you know is designed by Af yeah. So what well, well, people don't know is the the what up, Jason? Uh, the the hoodies that I've and the sweaters that I've been wearing that say Africa on it. Yeah, it's part of his company. Yeah, and his manager is the one that produces produces it, and that's that's great. Exactly, his heart has always been there, but for me, it just you know, and, and that all-star, you'd be surprised how many players came up to me and they were like, yo, that was powerful, you know, from oh, both bro. sides of the all-star game. Everyone was like, yo, that, that was powerful, man. Like, I'm glad you did that, you know, and I was so happy about that. But, you know, to fast forward. No, 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 no. hold up. We're not going to fast forward. <laughs> no, bro, you, forward. you're no, the no, one. Just, yo, you're no, the because one who, you, you you're don't the understand G the magnitude of it. Or I know you don't like to talk about yourself. But you're the you GM, bro. You got, you got phone calls you got to make. Yeah, I got a phone call in an hour. Well, all right. We're good. But right. you have to understand the magnitude. Shout out to Arsenal. <laughs> See? And then that's when you go. You come back down to earth. Okay, my you, bad. Hey. You start up here and... <laughs> <laughs> God bless our home, my guy. Come on, come on. What? Hey, come on. Yo, this guy. Um, what's the call? But now, uh, so what I'm saying is, uh, with with that intentionality, like my brother said, you definitely have to understand that um, how big that moment was. Like I always thought, um, thought you know, you was, you know, I, I looked up to you in regards to how you pushed the culture and always, you know, spoke to. Um, Spoke to your um, spoke to who you were, but I like to you know that moment right there made you an African giant. I appreciate it, man, bro. I, I was so really, I was by myself in Moscow. I was by myself in Moscow, sitting Moscow, there, you know. freezing Moscow, and I was and I, it was like four in the morning, bro. It was four in the morning, and I was watching the game just to see my boy get announced and want and play first All Star game. And when you lifted up that shirt, yo. Yeah, Single tear came down, bro. It was, it was different. And, and, and I like to know that was a moment where I was like, like, who are you? Who am I? Who am I yeah. to 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 not to not push my culture or embrace my culture or do it for the culture? Like exactly. my mom and dad lived in um have lived in London for 30, 40 plus 50 years maybe. And they still no, 40 years I should say, they still are are, are very Ghanaian. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Nothing has changed them and nothing forced them to change. Nothing forced them to control. Bro, but that's credit, man. I, I, I honestly I always tell people, man, like it, hey, it matters it matters the, the household, like, you know, you, your brothers, everyone in the family. You know, mm -hmm. you're so determined to make things happen in Africa, make things happen in Ghana. And that's for a reason, bro. You know what I mean? It's like you walk in your house, you were in Africa, you know. You you walked outside the house. You might have been in London. You, you were in that house. I was in Kumasi. I was in Kumasi <laughs> the whole time, bro. So when yeah. people tell me, "Oh, you grew up in London. The food there is is, is crap," and <laughs> uh, <it's, laughs> we're gonna speak about that. The food there is crap. I was like, "Yeah," but I grew up eating eating uh, fufu and jollof rice and all that other kind of stuff. I didn't eat any food. I used yeah. to eat my culture, and that's exactly. what I'm about. like you said. When I went to school, it was either. It was either Africa, um, Africans or, or, or Caribbean, people yeah. from the Caribbean. So yeah. that was our culture, and that's what I knew. Yeah. And, you know, but it's still, I, I still didn't even embrace it at that point. And when I went home, I had to go back to, to, my, to my roots. 
And so now, you know, I, like I love the pride that when my mom gets to see me or my, my parents get to see me pushing the coach. And my mom said something to me that almost broke my heart a few years ago. She saw me at the game. She saw me at the NBA Africa game and was like, oh, man, I'm seeing you wearing this kente at the game. I didn't even know you liked kente. Kente is my favorite fabric. When my yeah. chocolate who makes um, or most of my clothes, um, traditional wear in, in Ghana, makes my clothes, the first thing I said to him was, I need kente in, 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 in my outfit. Anything you make for me, I want a piece of kente. And it's my favorite fabric. It's got history. It's got power. It speaks to my, my, my culture and my heritage. And my mom saw that. And I was a 33-year-old man. And she didn't know that I liked kente, kente cloth. Yeah, that's crazy. That's powerful, bro. You know, and, and, and it's funny. I wore um, a kaftan to one of my games. You know, I'm a yeah. general manager. So I got to be in the suit. I yeah. get there, and my assistant GM, he hits me up and he's like, um, you tell us we always got to be in suits and be in business attire. I was like, okay, wh what are you saying? He was like, oh, you got, you got, and there's no fault of his. He said, you've got, um, you got an African traditional wear. And I was like, where I'm from, this is considered a suit. So when you see me, you see, you see Africa. You understand? Yeah. This, is, this is our culture. This is what we wear. And I, was, yeah. and I used to go to the games and my owner saw it. He was like, man, I need one of these. Can you get me one? And that's how, that's how powerful our, who we are and our culture really is. Because yeah. when they see it and they see how cool it is, they're like, man. They embrace it. They, they, they embrace it. And for the longest, I felt, I felt, I felt mortified that I, I, did not, um, <laughs> I did not embrace it. <laughs> I did not embrace my culture and who I am. So, nah, you know, nah, it's definitely got to speak to that. <clears throat> yeah, no, I know exactly what you're saying. For me, it, it, honestly, it happened when I went to Senegal, man. Uh, I went to Senegal where well, I'm going to do, and you know how they're big on their culture in Senegal. And, you know, landed and we just drive them back. We, we get to where we're going, and everyone came. When I tell you, I promise you, no one had a suit on or nothing. Everyone had traditional clothes, but it was tailored to a point that it was, it's like, on on the point like it wasn't baggy it wasn't too tight it, was, it just it's smooth everyone was smooth and Please. i remember i remember leaving senegal and i'm like yo I, I gotta get this i gotta get people to like to to dress like this like what mm -hmm. you know part of why when we do all this pan afro link and everything when we do the events and we encourage people to come dressed you know because it just it mo it's motivating man it, it makes you proud mm -hmm. even if you know you see another country or somewhere in Africa that you didn't even know about. When, when people show up and they like embracing and wearing the traditional clothes, bro, you just, you want it too. You know, you just want to rock that thing. Like, it's just, it's so dope, man. It's so dope. And, it's, and, and while we're here, I got to give a shout out. You know, I know I love the fact that you do Pan Afro Link, which is, you know, great for the culture and great for bringing us together. Also got to give a major shout out to my guy, family at African Chop House because he was, he was doing, uh, he put together a concept and an idea that brings great African, great African food, drinks, people, and music together. And it's, it's so dope that when I saw it, I was like, yo, I, I want to be a part of this. And mm -hmm. I think one of the proudest moments uh, in my life is when we all got together when Black Panther came out mm -hmm. and did a screening and then did the, um, did the African Chop House at your house. Like, that was... Like, I'm going to say it like this. If anybody knows anything about All-Star Weekend, when you get to All-Star Weekend, the one thing that everybody wants to go to is the Jordan party. The one thing that everybody wants to attend is the Michael Jordan party. Because it's his birthday and all the celebrities and all the players are there. And we had, and we had Chop House the exact same day. And we was like, we're going to have it. And then it ended at 10 o'clock so people can go on to the Jordan party. At 10 o'clock, things were just getting started. And, people, and I'm telling you, there's people who were like, we don't need to go to the Jordan party. The party's right here. Yeah. And because of the, the, the music, the food, the culture, the people, and to see that, man, that really, really touched me, man. It touched me that people embraced it that way and, and didn't care about, you know, being seen at, 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 a, at the, the it place. And they were there. And to the point that the next year, they asked, they were asking, when are you guys going to... Um, <laughs> when are you guys going to do it again? When are you guys going to do it this year? And, you know, shout out to my guy Stanley. And, you know, putting that together is definitely a special moment for me. Yeah, no, Stan has always been supportive of everyone, man. You know, for mm -hmm. people who don't know Stan, um, 
I remember when we put it together and Stan was just, you know, so motivating in terms of he's been doing it for so many years mm -hmm. and he will go anywhere and do it. Uh, it doesn't matter where. If you're mm -hmm. trying to do it for Africa, Stanley is there, man. He's there, man. He's there. You know, Big up. Big up. Start out Big up. Big up. Big up. But let's talk, let's talk about um, what's going on in Africa right now. One second. Uh, if, again, if you have questions, because today's episode um, is only going to be an hour, maybe an hour 15, because again, I am a, I do have work. I am a general manager. He's busy. He just said you're busy, man. You're no, a busy I'm not guy. Check busy, you know, this, this is one of the most important episodes to me. So I would yeah, love so, it to go No, no, it's hours. a very important episode, but we have to let people know that today we're cutting it short because our GM, our GM has a meeting with the other GMs about, you know, returning. It, mm -hmm. it is important. You know what I mean? But we still right. managed to, you know, squeeze in an hour. And which actually the show started, well, we started this an hour, but... Danny, it, hold that thought. I'll be right back. Wait, how are you going to just... This This is what I'm saying, man. We got to stop practicing. We got to stop practicing this show before we go on air. Because now I'm just left with everybody watching. And I'm just talking to myself. So I'm just going to continue talking. But... Uh, Anyway, so I went from doing a live to now hosting my TV show. So uh, welcome to. Continue. Sorry. Go ahead. What's up? Bro, it's not even halftime. There is no, there's not going to be a halftime today. So I had to do it in the second quarter. But how are you just going to go? We're live, bro. Like, I, I, I don't understand. The show must go on. Yeah, but if this is like. If we're going to do this to, like, the caliber of where we want to get it to, you can't just get up and leave in the middle of life. That's the thing. That's the thing. There's too much structure in this world. Sometimes you have to just go with the flow. Sometimes you have to just go in and be able to improvise to what's going on. And that's we're trying to I always keep people guessing. You never know if I'm going to show up or how I'm going to show up. What does what, what Serge, make, Serge say? I don't do fashion. I do art. I do art. Okay? This is art. Yeah, we do this is not fashion. Sense. This is art. Yo, listen, bro. This is all. Hey, yeah. bro, we try to tell people to be disciplined and do the right thing, and you know, we, I'm doing we, the right thing. Yeah, we're not. No, we can't just freestyle it, bro. We we're on the no, show. No, you don't always freestyle. You can have a coach and you can have a lane, but sometimes if a, something gets in your way, you go this way, and then still. But you can't. Way. You can't just leave. I was directly talking to you. I wasn't like telling a story. You know, it's different if I was like. Yeah, fellas, yesterday I was just, you know, minding, walking around. I was actually asking you, you know, what's going on in Africa now, and you just got up and left. So I had to continue without you being there. It's like if we were talking right now and I just left. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't mean you just don't sit there and just say, oh, we're I'm, trying, I'm trying to figure out your point. I'm huh? trying to figure out your point. My whole point is you can't just get up and leave, bro. So, so here's an analogy for you. So when you go into a game, you go into a game with a game plan. You go into a game saying, hey, I'm going to have to guard LeBron. I have to guard LeBron, and I'm going to send him left every time. Every time he goes left, he gets a dunk. What do you do? You adjust. So that's I just the, made you adjust. Pops, Pops, that's the difference. What's the difference? If you and I, we're in the same team right now. We're not like, I'm not going against LeBron or you. Like, if we're going for a layup and it's pass, pass, layup, if you just disappear and run the other way back, I can't pass to you. I, you know, I, I can't mean, gather you don't my, need pass to me twice no, a game anyway. All you bro, have to do I is can't gather my dribble. I can't gather my dribble and go past you and you run back the other way. What, what, no, come on, bro. Okay, we're okay. the same team. Respect, respect. Anyways, All right, yo, I think but, Stan just joined. He missed the shout out we gave him. But again, shout out to my guy, African Chop House. Uh, big up. So what we got next, Lou? Where we at? Are you going to... Hey, nice top, by the way. Respect, respect. Nice, nice change up, man. Can, you know... It's, it's hot now, though. I'm, I'm going to open it up. It's hot. Right. Let's go. So where we at? So where did you want to start with first, Lou? I want to talk about just where we are now in terms of Africa. We talked a little bit about where it was when we were growing up. Where are we now in terms of, you know, it's a lot of things going on in Africa. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people who don't know what's going on. So let's talk a little bit about, let's start it with, before we go to the business part, let's just talk about your involvement basketball-wise within the continent. And a lot of people don't even know what you're starting and what you're doing in Ghana mm -hmm. right now, which to me is amazing. And you and I spoke about it for a long time. But for you to be doing it right now, 
you know, let's talk about what it took, you know, how you got back, how you're involved in Ghana, how you're involved in the rest of Africa. Um, wow. So, yeah, you know, think about it again. When I finally got made it to the NBA, I really wanted to um, – that, that it was never about me. It was about trying to inspire and put my coach on, put my people on, and and make everybody proud. Now that I'm retired and got on this side of the game, being one of only two or three Ghanaian uh, um, players of uh, players of Ghanaian heritage to have made it to the NBA, I feel like it's my uh, social responsibility to give back. And to and to pull back into my community, I always say our parents migrated or came to our respective countries, whether it be Europe, whether it be the United States, or wherever, to sacrifice so that their children could live a better life for, to an extent. You know, I'm not saying Africa wasn't a um, a place to live a better life, but they they knew there was opportunities there. And fast forward 30, 40 years later, it's when we're all successful within our own right and accomplished. It's time. It's time to go back to the continent and re and, and invest in and pour back into our, our our continent. And for me, the way that looked was, you know, providing basketball camps, um, starting an academy, and giving these kids an opportunity and an avenue to to be successful successful through the game. I mean, we were fortunate enough to go to high school, go to college, and then go to the NBA. But I remember, remember when we went to. We, went, we did the first camp in Ghana. First time I ever went to Ghana, I was I was 29 years old. I was 30 years old. First time I ever went to Ghana was with Lou. And we go to a camp, and this kid was pretty good. And he comes up to me and says, hey, I you know, I want to go to high school. I want to go to college and play in the U.S. I was like, okay, let's, let's figure out how to do this. Like, how old are you? He was like, I'm 22. I was like, man, it, it, it was. It broke my heart because I was like, I can't, I can't help this uh, kid. I can't do nothing. He can't even go to college. Really, he's 22 years old, and it was, it was difficult. And I, and I said from that day forward, I had to. I was never gonna allow that to happen again. I was never gonna allow. That's somebody's life that just got changed. Had we met him at 16, 17, he could have went to high school, went to college, and had a whole different life. Now we, I was like, now we have to provide a, a, a bridge and a, an avenue for these kids to get to this next level. And it's, the responsibility was on us. It was on me. And so, I, you know, that, that's, that was the start of it. And, you know, for me, doing these camps and, doing, and starting this academy is a step in the right direction. But we have so much more work to do and so much more things to do, like thinking about basketball without borders. The Basketball African League is a great foundation uh, of the change in the future of Africa. And hopefully with everything that's starting in in Ghana, there's going to be a time where there's going to be a team and there's going to be an arena and a place for there to be a professional team in Ghana too. And I, the first thing I said to Amadou when they announced the Basketball Africa League was, I'm owning the team in Ghana. I intend to have a team and own a team in Ghana because that's when I, that's when I know that the sport would have reached uh, a position of prominence. Mm. Mm -hmm. No, that's dope. what about yourself? Though? You got to speak to you know what you're doing with your camps and you know what you're doing um, in South Sudan and you know the federation and everything like that. Yeah, no, you know it's uh, for me it's it's such a it's it's a good feeling. Honestly, I'm not gonna lie, it's a good feeling to be in a position to to do the things that I'm doing. Um, you know, my brother moved back. Uh, to South Sudan just to focus on running the the academy that we started a while back where mm -hmm. it wasn't just about basketball, but it's about just using the ba basketball to help kids um, and also to help, you know, most of our coaches in the Manubo court that we have in South Sudan, most of the coaches are, we paid for their tuition to go to, to colleges. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're coaching the kids, but, you know, they're getting paid to pay for their school and the school allowed us to build a basketball court inside the university, um, which is the whole system is dope. But now we worked with Matter where we, you know, bought in innovation hubs. And what an innovation hub is, is basically a classroom that, you know, could hold 15 to 20 kids at a time that you bring in and set it right outside the court. Mm -hmm. So building a program that's just bigger than basketball. But for me, honestly, when I went back, uh, <laughs> When I first went back to South Sudan, I went to uh, Kakuma refugee camp and I stayed there for two weeks with my friend. And See, nobody knows that kind of stuff, man. I'll, I know, but that's crazy. 
Yeah, and the first thing I did was build a basketball court in Kakuma Refugee Camp, which is in Kenya, but it holds a large South Sudanese um, uh, immigrants there. So for me, I felt that that was the first move. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that. And the reason why I did it is because when I was there, I saw I went to a basketball court that had 27 different teams that were playing a the league there. And at the time, there were 75,000 people in the Kakuma Refugee Camp. And I just, right away, I knew that I had to get involved and I had to give back in whatever way, you know. I started to understand that doing a little bit of something is better than not doing anything at all. And, mm -hmm. you know, and that goes to a lot of people where people think you have to have so much in order to help. Uh, you really don't. There's so many ways of helping, and this is part of what we're going to talk about. There's so many ways to be involved within helping people in Africa, and you don't have to have so much to do it. Just because I'm doing this much doesn't mean you have to do the same. Questions. Anybody's got questions? I see people keep wanting to have questions. After. Just remember, uh, uh, hit the question mark and send your questions to Lou right there so that we can reference them if we... Um, Actually, good point, because at the time... Uh, Oh, I like this one. Let me know if you could see it again because we can see it. I can see it. Mm, we spoke about this. How can we collaborate with each other? Uh, do you want to take this one or do you want me to go? Um, you can go first. I think you know. For me, and part of why, um, you know, we got it. Uh, shout out to Eddie Cuddy, by the way, who you know, uh, for me. And you, Pops, obviously, Eddie's been someone that, you know, not only became a close friend of ours, but, you know, I was watching Eddie from far, making everyone laugh, but it was always with pride and joy about, you know, where he comes from. And, you know, it, it motivated me in a way where I remember telling Eddie that one day we're going to do something together. Uh, and, Pops, you and I spoke about it. I, I don't think, you know, for me, you don't have to be a basketball player or athlete in order to connect. Um, you know, and, and even what we're trying to do with Pan Afrolink is we try to connect with so many people from different fields and different backgrounds and different languages um, in Africa um, and people just with, you know, um, African background. I, I think that it's important that, you know, we don't forget about um, – uh, Afro Latinos or you know the Caribbean and mm -hmm. that's to me that's what the whole Africa is when I say Africa I don't want people to think I'm only talking about the continent and the people are still in the continent I'm talking about people that are all connected with the continent of Africa how can we all collaborate and come together and for me it's very powerful when we all come together and speak in one voice and also show unity within what we do together no matter what it is and supporting each other you know when Pops talks about Ghana you know, for me, I went to Ghana way before I was going to, you know, just always going back to South Sudan. I wasn't going, always going back to South Sudan. I was going to Tanzania. I went to <laughs> Angola. I went to Uganda. I went to Senegal. I went to Mozambique. I went to, you know, you name it. Um, I went. And the reason I did that was because I felt that, you know, everyone was my brothers and sisters and I wanted to be in Africa. You know, I remember going to Tanzania and they built a court. Uh, and named it after me, and it's still wow. in Tanzania. And for me, I always felt uh, with Hashim, going back with Hashim and, you know, going to Tanzania and doing stuff, I felt like I'm home. When I go to Ghana with you, I feel like I'm home. When we did the school in Ghana with Fuse mm -hmm. uh, and Shaka, bringing us all together and doing the schooling, I didn't mind it was in Ghana. Or, you know, the school that uh, we renovated in Jamaica, uh, to me, that's how we collaborate and work together. It doesn't have to be your project. It could be a, somebody else's project that makes sense and you want to be a part of it and just jumping in and making it happen however you can. I would speak to that, though, because I think it's a very important point. When we went to go see my, um, the, my uncle, the king, we went to go see the king in, in Kumasi, and the first thing he said when he started standing together, like, about how like how we favored each other. And I was like, well, I mean, we're both tall and dark, but that's about it. He was like, no, you don't understand how far back this connection goes. And he talked about the migration that happened from East Africa that went across the continent to, to where I'm from in West Africa. And he was like, they all came from, from South Sudan and Sudan at the time. And 
you know, Kenya and all the all those, you know, East African countries that migrated across. And some of them stopped in Central Africa, some stopped in Senegal, some stopped in Ghana and kept going. That's why you see similar sim people look similar from totally different countries and different parts of the uh, of the continent. And yeah. it just spoke to the um the power. The power that and the uh, um the strength in the genes. The fact that even after all these centuries and years later, um, we still favor each other and, and our body types are the same. You didn't obviously wasn't blessed with being jump off jump that high, but you know, you could probably run for for, for two straight days. So you know, again, um, it just shows you how much more connected we really are. But uh, yeah, man, yeah. That's, that's dope. Man. That's dope. Yeah, no, uh, with saying that, I think I want to really encourage people, everyone. I think for me, uh, before we went to Ghana, me and Amadou were talking a lot, and um, I started reading uh, Sheikh Anti Job uh, books. Uh, Sheikh Anti Job is uh, from Senegal, and I think that I want to really encourage people to get those books. And the books really talks about. Mm -hmm. Uh, the books talks about, you know, South Sudan and the connection between, you know, Sudan at the time, uh, between Sudan and the rest of Africa. Mm -hmm. And we South Sudanese, we like to believe that, you know, uh, everyone has different opinion, but we believe that we're the first humans on earth. You know, they date way back, even when they found the remain, you know, the first human um, uh, bones or the oldest human bones is in the uh, area where we are from. So, for us, we really believe that, but Sheikh Anti oh, yeah. talks about it in the book and talks about, you know, the migration between, from East Africa into the rest of Africa. But, you know, for years and years and years, you got people who want to tell you, you know, other things. And this is, and I'm talking about not just Africa, I'm talking about the whole world, you know, the migration started from there. And if you go to Senegal, a lot of Senegalese look like South Sudanese. We share the same name. Mm. When you speak Wolof or you speak in our language, there's a lot of similar words. Uh, there's a lot of similarity in the DNA. Even if you get your DNA test, a lot of South Sudanese are getting feedback that they're from Senegal and vice versa. So the connection is definitely there. And Sheikh Auntie Job was talking about it years and years and years ago, well, even when they denied him, when he said that, you know, ancient Egyptians were, you know, black. Uh, and, you know, there's the documentaries out there of people really trying to deny what he was trying to say, and now it's proven. So... You know, history and this to me all came together when we went to Ghana and, you know, we went to your village and, you know, they were breaking this down face to face. We were sitting there, I remember, mm -hmm. and it was just getting broken down on how it really happened and everything. And to me, that was a dope, dope moment. So, But speak to, uh, I was talking to somebody else about um, the respect that you give people. And I was like, because somebody didn't know that I had to play basketball or what I was doing currently. I was like, I don't really offer up a lot of that information because I know people usually determine the level of respect they give you by your title or what it is that you do. But you remember we were in the Olympics uh, um, and we ran into Adams Parker. <laughs> what? What's Adam Parker got to um, do with you, No, listen, listen, to the, listen to the point I'm making. Adams Parker is a, a random guy walking working in the olympic village and he was he was like picking up traps he he walks by lou and i and he's like you're from south sudan and you're from ghana and we're like what then he says something in um south sudan he says something in tree yeah and we're looking at this guy like what and he says oh i speak 11 languages and just starts running off all these different languages that he spoke and, and his name Parker. is adam and his name, and his name is adam, adam parker, parker. And he was literally the most interesting person I ever met, but it just spoke to the 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 culture and it spoke to how how somebody like him, how special he was and the impact he was having on people. He was, he was a janitor. And you would and you would never imagine that somebody who was a janitor in London had so much um knowledge, intelligence and was was cultured in a way that I've never seen before in my life. And it was, it was, I was just, it just came, came to mind. But in that regard, speak, let, let's talk about how we spoke about what we're currently doing in Africa through the game of Africa. Speak about the state of Africa right now and how we intend to help it in the future. Like, speak with the pandemic going on and the quarantine. How are we, like, 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 what worries you about what's going on in the continent today? I think, um, for me, the one thing always worried me is I, I think it's changing a little bit if we 
pay you know the right mindset to to the right people and listen to the right people i think that in the past africa has always been used to uh to almost uh you know the stories about africans or africa were told by other people apart from africans um and i think the world became accustomed to it it became the norm that you think you know africa but not from africans i think you know growing up you see in movies and you see you know in the news it's always the struggle and i'm not saying that africans are not struggling but there's so much to africa beside the struggle uh there's so much to seeing a picture of a kid playing outside with no shoes on uh there's so much joy in that from that kid even though he has no shoes there's so much joy and happiness with the kids that they're playing with and their surrounding and the happiness they're around but we've been told a story where you know those kids are suffering and they have no shoes and you know and the other side of it you're seeing stories of kids who are sitting in a nice home playing in a nice grass and you you're being told that's happiness right there and i'm not saying that you know there's things that needs to uh there there isn't things that need to improve in africa there definitely is but our story cannot be told because they don't understand our joy so you know for me i had and you were there in south africa when you know i had to put it in perspective to people you know to say that you know for the longest our stories have been told and until africans get together and really push that you know mindset away where we constantly listen to what direction we got to take we're always going to be playing the catch up game but if we start to think about the things that we have that they don't have and you know highlight those things and make those things the reason why they need to go to africa and and enjoy africa you don't necessarily if you're comparing the two if you think you want to go you know to africa and be in I don't know the best commercial that you see on TV of hotels and comfort and you know everything being the way it is in the west you already said in your mindset up and you're setting yourself up for failure where you're not going to like Africa mm-hmm. but now if we put you know the things that we have that they don't have over here the things that you actually should be missing you know the things I was just talking about the fact that you can just go to your neighbor's house and they could cook for you or you know those are the things that we cannot lose that don't exist over here but we don't highlight them so when people go over there they expect to live like how they live in here that's not how it's going to work we're always going to be playing the catch up game so for me you know that's really the direction that I want to push and that's why the basketball africa league to me us being involved was important uh you can't just make a league without africans being involved and you know with what amadou is doing and bringing us along for example right now with this uh pandemic going on we were able to do a 1 minute clip you know through basketball africa league that's playing on tv in some african chan- uh, uh african countries right now that to me alone for a kid to see our face you know and where we're talking about yo wash your hands and these are kids that are, they look up to us but now they're seeing another side of us that that wasn't going to happen if that league doesn't exist mm-hmm. you know so things like that are important for for our future so No that's 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 powerful right there but speaking of powerful we were in Johannesburg for the basketball I um, mean for the NBA Africa. and you know you you were one of the cats that up on stage and you know every time you know I'm speaking on the topic that is Africa I always reference your speech that day and now that we're here you know it would be the Travis Steve I was the one to to speak to it you know speak to what you said about Africa now and Africa moving forward like that one line um you said was like it's one thing that resonated to me more than anything else in in years man speak to what you said that one line that what you said man and 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 talk talk to it please speak to it. No it's very similar to what I just said it, it it's basically uh are you talking about the part where I said you know where our story has always been told uh people talk about what africa needs instead of what africa has mm-hmm. um yeah and that's you know along those line i think that every time every time man every time something has been told about africa is what africa needs but that's just a misleading statement and mm-hmm. a misleading quote to get you thinking that they're actually helping you you know it's it's time you start talking about what does africa have you know it is so much that's in africa that they want and they need but we've been told a story that we're the ones struggling 
You know, there's mm -hmm. people, there's people right now in the U.S. I can tell you that there's people in the U.S., there's people in Europe, there's people starving. You will never see that side of the story. You go to Africa, they never ever think that someone is starving in the U.S. or in Europe. You know, you come here in the U.S. or in Europe, you say Africa right away, they want to, their mindset right away goes to struggling or a kid that's starving. This, don't get me wrong, those things do exist and we got to improve them. But don't take our joy away. Don't take the fact that we have a lot to offer. There's a lot in our culture that, you know, teaches us what it means to, you know, to be a decent and a good human being that, that goes a long way that we're losing, you know? So for me, I think those are the stories that we got to get back to when we talk about Africa and what people are expecting. You know, if you're expecting to compare, you, if, if you're, you know, picking out what you like and what you don't like, it just depends on who you are at that point. I can't help you at that point. But if you're looking for something that, you get from Africa that you're gonna that you don't get elsewhere, then you're gonna you know find something special. That's really the bottom line of it, you know. Yeah. And I know we got we got eight minutes. We we did talk about how we're gonna continue this. So I think we talked a lot about you know things that needs to be done. But I think for the future episode, we really should talk about you know investing in Africa and mm -hmm. you know because I get a lot of questions with people. How do we get involved? Not only investing with money, but investing with time, uh, investing with your, you know, experience, uh, what you know, what you learn. How do you get involved? There's so many ways to invest in Africa besides just, you know, money. So I think we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that next time. I really want to. And I want to share with people just many different ways of how you could get involved. And what I meant earlier, what I said earlier, I meant this. You know, I can't look at the next person or what they're putting in and thinking that's mm -hmm. what I got to put in. You know, your input is different than anyone else's. So, um, yeah. Any any other questions you got over there? Someone if you said, got a question, is, fire. I'm gonna look for a, a question, but if you got one, go ahead. Someone said, I'm "What's looking. in Luau's cup?" Excuse me. Excuse me. Someone said, "What's in Luau's cup?" Uh, water. Water. Yeah. Yeah. African, uh, African water. Um, no, no, you know, you know, since it was, uh, I can't look and uh, talk at the same time, but okay, we'll, we'll keep looking then. Um, so I know people are trying to figure out how to get, like you said, Ooh, I like this question. So this is different, but um, I leave this up there. But yo, since yesterday, um, you know, because I don't know if we talked about it or not, I'm you know, must have forgot, but you know, my earlier years when I was younger, um, you know might be something different but you know grown man now and looking back and looking back at things and how things used to have moved it's just you, you have to change things as you get older you know so you know it's just you gotta start drinking more water and uh, yeah so it probably tastes different in the in the arsenal cup it probably tastes like i'm not gonna say that but anyway um you got five minutes. This it doesn't cool. taste like what we think of Tottenham. It, it's very sweet. <laughs> very, very sweet. Um, <laughs> All right, yeah, so uh, this is a good question. Uh, what, are, what, what are the opportunities for women basketball in Africa, and how can Val impact this? This is a very, very, very good question. Uh, go ahead, Pops. Um, I think, you know, for us, when we were doing the, when we did the camp, um, they thought it was just only going to be a boys' camp. <laughs> We had to stress and let everybody know that these opportunities are not just for for one side. It wasn't just for um, the boys or, or or males, and you know we made it for for girls too. And I think that they're, they're just obviously they're just as important as the guys are. So you know we're going to continue to provide those opportunities for the females too, because you know I know it's not as big of a sport. It's not as prevalent in. In, in, on the continent or in Africa, but that's where the narrative has to change. And that's where mm. we come in to provide those opportunities for for the ladies to, to get an opportunity to play the game too. So look where where 20 years ago, where things were in regards to the WNBA or you know what's going on in women's basketball here. Now you have women with signature shoes. You have you know um, women you know doing all these campaigns and everything, and the WNBA as prominent as it's ever been and now that salaries have gone up. So, you know, the future is bright and it's continuing to grow when it comes to the women's basketball. So, and I definitely feel like Africa is going to be a big part of that. 
Yeah, no, I love that you said that. You know, to, to jump into that, because I just, you know, took the job as president of Basketball Federation in South Sudan. And two things that I really want to push for, and I don't know if it will ever happen in Africa or majority of African countries, but two things. And part of the reason why I wanted to be the president of Federation, because I teamed up with, obviously, my foundation. But what we're doing is we're encouraging families to allow us to, to have girls team in every age group. So under 14, whether it's under 12, under 16, under 18. And what we're doing is every time uh, you allow your daughters to join our team, they not only get free scholarships to schools, but, you know, they get books, they get, you know, uh, tuition, they get. So for me, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, just about, it's not just about basketball. It's about using basketball to open other doors. So that's my number one thing. And for me, when you could do that, when you could get more girls into sports, I guarantee you when they go to school, more percentage than the boys, they will become, whether it's doctors, lawyers, they will finish their degree uh, and they will take it very, very serious. They will appreciate that scholarship a lot more. So it's using basketball and sports as a tool. So that's one. Secondly, I hate that we follow the Western world of school system. And the reason why I say that is I really want African to push high school into the age of 20. And the reason why I say that and build more boarding schools. And the reason why I say that is it allows girls to be away from home, more girls to be away from home. So it, it, it really uh, lowers the percentage of uh, underage marriages. Right. And it allows girls to be in school and it allows them to focus more on schoolwork instead of a lot of household making them do a lot of other stuff that's not necessarily or it's the culture mindset, the old mindset of women have to do so much more than just focusing on their schoolwork. So that's something that I really want to push for. Um, and the reason why, you know, it's high school doesn't have to be 18. You know what I mean? Like, you know, even if university starts at 18 and finish at 20, we could put classes in a boarding school, you know, where they, where they, when you're 18, you could take college uh, classes in a boarding school for two years and maybe go to university for two years. So you still finish at the same age, mm -hmm. but we still call it high school. So those kids are away and protected from home, especially the girls. And those are my two things. And that's what I think Val can do and open opportunities, more boarding schools. So Right. I remember there was that girl. We're gonna cut off. We're gonna cut off. We got we got two minutes remaining, Pop. So give your piece, give your shout out. We're gonna continue this next time. Uh Pop's got a very important meeting with the GM. Yo, go hold us down. Yo, walk in like this. Hey, go walk in like this. I'm here. <laughs> This it, camp is here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, Yo, you got one minute. Go ahead, Pops. Go ahead real quick. You got one minute. No, nah, again, like I said, this was probably one of my most impactful and favorite subjects and episode um, just because of it was speaking to our culture and who we are and what we're doing on the continent. And I appreciate everybody for, for joining and watching. I think it's um, dope and it's going to continue. Next episode, we'll, we'll let you know it's coming Monday. And Tuesday, I'm, we're going live with Amadou on the BAL account to talk about everything uh, basketball Africa. So, respect more time. I'm here. All right, man. Respect. All right, everyone. All right. Peace. We'll continue.